What is the connection between the California Gold Rush, Rip Pockets, and the color blue? Think of a great invention that you use maybe every single day. For work, for play, for convenience. They sort of have this essence of coolness about them. Classless, ageless, adaptable, everywhere. A modern phenomenon, soon to reach 2 billion units sold every year. We think they're all American, but as we'll reveal, they would never have been invented without the ingenuity of Europeans. They have expression, modesty, sex appeal, and simplicity. They became synonymous with real-life cowboys, and then movie cowboys. They look great, they're sturdy, they can last a very long time. But there's a darker side to the story, at a time when we're learning to put the planet first. This is a fashion that's not going away anytime soon. So if we can think about sustainability, that's going to matter. Can we move fast enough and change the manufacturing habits of a lifetime? Will we ever fall out of love with blue denim jeans? Jeans are the casual, cool statement that millions of people globally choose to make every day. The biggest market in revenue terms is North America, followed by China. But experts report that sales are up across the world, from the Asia-Pacific region to South America to Europe. All this contributes to a global market worth billions of dollars and predicted to rise. Recent statistics suggest that the average American has seven pairs of jeans in their closet. And that average American buys four new pairs every year. How many pairs of jeans do I have? I must have about 30 pairs of jeans. That sounds like a lot. At a guess, I would say that I've got about 30 pairs of jeans. I do wear jeans, yeah, I've got two pairs. Why have jeans endured in such an unpredictable industry as fashion, when most other great ideas fall by the wayside after just a few seasons? Designers are driven to invent new fabrics, new looks, new fiber combinations. Once human beings started inventing clothing, we were on the long road to the invention of jeans. For millennia, Clothing had been made out of easily accessible materials like animal skins and fur, probably born out of a basic necessity to keep warm. We developed cutting tools and rudimentary needles, which meant we could cut hides into even shapes that could be sewn together and decorated. We experimented with wool and plant fibers, like cotton. From these, we made thread and invented ways of weaving. This Tarkan dress from ancient Egypt is the oldest known woven piece of clothing. It's over 5,000 years old and made of linen. Its beautiful details like tailored sleeves, narrow pleats, and a v-neck demonstrate an early sense of fashion. People have always wanted to dress up, and clothes have always been meaningful. Um, and there has, in that sense, always been fashion. There's always been a desire to have what is nice and new and is going to be imitated. To imitate, we had to make copies of a garment if it proved popular, so we invented new tools to speed up processes. We developed implements to card or comb the wool or cotton to separate it, ready for spinning. Then, over a thousand years ago, we invented the spinning wheel. This one is a contemporary copy. And we discovered that silk, cotton, and wool could be spun to make yarn. This image shows the world's oldest trousers, pieced together from remnants found buried in Western China. Dating back 3,000 years, they're woven in wool, and German archeologists think they were a uniform worn by warriors for horse riding. Once again, the sophisticated decorative embroidery detail 
gives us an insight into early fashion. It's always been the rich who've had the means to follow fashion, but poor working people and peasants would wear the same simple clothes all their lives, even though their clothes were barely fit for purpose. The pre-industrial world is a world in which the poor are always ragged, in which clothing is always hard to get hold of. Weavers the world over worked on new, stronger fabrics that could be made more efficiently. Cotton textiles were particularly successful. Cotton grows easily and in abundance, producing strong, reliable yarn, which would eventually end up in denim jeans. I think denim has been so successful because it's made out of cotton, and cotton is this ubiquitous fabric that we, we discovered can be used to, to make clothes. To produce cotton fabric in larger quantities, inventors began tackling every part of the production process. Consequently, progress in textile manufacturing took leaps during the Industrial Revolution. First came the invention of a more efficient way to spin cotton into yarn. British weaver James Hargreaves invented his spinning jenny in 1764, when this one, demonstrated recently, was made. By turning a single wheel, eight spindles would simultaneously spin cotton or wool, instead of one on conventional spinning wheels. The second half of the 18th century sees the development of uh, industrial production of yarn the spinning jenny and a whole series of other innovations that enable them to turn cotton into, into a thread quickly and on scale. And that's transformative because what that enables them to do is to industrialize the production of thread, which then enables them to produce cotton goods much more cheaply. The spinning jenny led to the invention of mechanical weaving looms these ultimately created more durable clothes that were cheaper than before. From industrialization onwards, the poor are still ill-dressed, the poor are still struggling, but they are now shod and clothed in a way that they weren't before. And it's the beginning of the process that yields the incredibly cheap clothing of the modern day. Today, mass-produced clothing is the norm. But in the 18th century, every stage of production was open to improvement and invention. So in this time, the Industrial Revolution, it was a great time for innovation and coming up with ways of doing the jobs that people used to do in much more efficient ways. So Spinning Jenny is a fantastic example of that, where you're able to do what you know one person might have been doing or one machine might have been doing and kind of replicating that eight times over on the same device, essentially. As industrialization spread, new improved textiles were created for many applications, not just clothes. Northwestern Italy was one such area of production, centered around the port of Genoa. It was already a hub for the trade in raw cotton, which supplied local weavers. For centuries, there had been a market for strong, durable sailcloth, to supply trading ships and navies. They are having to produce not least sailcloth, which of course is vital for the trade uh, of, of the age. And so in Genoa, for example, you know, the weavers there become famous for the quality uh, and the, the endurance of the cloth that they're producing for sales. Sail fabric had to be tough to withstand the natural forces of wind and rain. Genoese weavers invented a particularly robust cotton corduroy, which became known as jean after Genoa. However, this wasn't yet the denim we know and love. Little did the Italian weavers know that their jean would inspire a French version of cotton twill that would change the world of clothing manufacture forever. 370 kilometers across the Mediterranean Sea, weavers in the southern French city of Nîmes 
tried to copy the successful, hard-wearing jean fabric from Genoa. But they failed to create a match. Instead, they invented a new cotton twill that is now instantly recognizable. The neem weavers call this fabric serge, and the weave combination of blue and white threads made it different. It appears predominantly blue, but tempered by the white. The weave was copied around the world, but these European roots are fundamental to the story of jeans. The word jean derives from the Italian city of Genoa, and the serge, denim, made in France became denim. So jeans are not the all-American invention you might have thought. Jeans were an unexpected success story. Given that fashion trends in fabrics, colors, and cuts are entirely fickle. Thanks to their longevity, factories the world over are now in business, like this one in Pakistan. From mass production to artisan production, like this in a small town in Wales. Pattern cutting is key in every business because it's the cut and fit that set each brand apart from the rest. Pair of jeans, you've literally got four panels. You've got your back pockets, you've got your waistband, your belt loop, your two bearers, and your fly. Then you have your pocket linings as well. So there's about 16 pieces go to make in a pair of jeans. Scissors are used for a single layer of fabric or ply, but an electric straight knife cuts through multiple plies in one go. This tool has been used for decades in the jeans industry. To mass produce blue jeans, denim is unrolled. Many layers of material are stacked and cut according to different patterns. In this Pakistani jeans factory, plies of denim are laid out and smoothed before cutting. The straight knife operators work speedily to cut out the pre-marked pattern shapes. The pieces are then taken to the stitching unit, where teams of sewing machine operators stitch them together. The globalization of the product might have surprised its inventors. The invention of jeans is down to two unlikely future fashion gurus. One had rivets, the other had some canvas and some cash. Together, they made an enduring piece of fashion magic. Yet their invention was simply about providing hardware and clothing for working men. Levi Strauss had sailed to New York City in 1847 to join his family firm in wholesale dry goods. But the potential business opportunities from the gold rush sent him to the west coast of America in San Francisco, where he set up shop, still trading in dry goods like clothing and blankets. 20 years later, he was selling a particularly strong new blue fabric. By now, the French Serge de Nîmes denim was being copied by textile factories elsewhere in Europe and America. Meanwhile, another immigrant, this time from Latvia, had set up shop as a tailor just 500 kilometers away from San Francisco in Reno, Nevada. Jacob Davis bought some of the new blue fabric from Strauss to make workwear. The clientele Davis specifically had in mind were miners, and of all the riskiest possible customers, Californian gold diggers. This film made in 1954 recreates the Californian gold rush and the excitement at the prospect of instant wealth once that first flake of gold was found. Gold is discovered in California. The discovery is made at Sutter's Mill, a hundred miles from a sleepy little town called San Francisco. Gold is right on the surface 
Everyone drops what he is doing to pan the precious metal. Gold prospectors thronged to California in their thousands in 1848. Such were the power and speed of the rumors of instant riches to be simply dug up from the ground. The 19th century is characterized by massive mobility, you know, huge numbers of people traveling across the globe, um, mainly to make their money. Six months after that first flake of gold was found, there were 4,000 gold miners in California. A year later, there were 80,000. Arriving in 1849, they came to be known as 49ers, coming from as far away as Europe, even China. But digging up a fortune was not guaranteed. The early prospectors are fortunate. I mean, they'll have a terrible time, but they will actually find what they want. The later prospectors arrive and are often just put to work by the early people. What became clear was that the gold prospectors' clothes were not fit for purpose. They ended up with ripped pockets, having been filled with the heavy spoils of digging and panning. They needed someone to design work clothes with super strong pockets. Jacob Davis was that someone. In 1871, he hit upon an idea that would change fashion history. A tiny, seemingly insignificant little fixing that would provide strength at pressure points like pocket corners that would make all the difference to the durability of the clothing. Rivets. The rivet, at least from a physics standpoint, is sort of taking forces that could be applied to areas that, you know, like pockets or seams that have a lot of pressure and force applied to them and sort of distributing it around its circular shape um, and protecting the material, adding a sort of extra layer of reinforcement so that the clothing doesn't fall apart. Jacob Davis, the tailor, had strong fabric purchased from Strauss and rivets, but he didn't have the money to buy the patent for his revolutionary idea. Levi Strauss was simply a businessman, albeit a successful one, but his role was pivotal. Firstly, he stocked this new blue fabric called denim, and secondly, he had the means to invest in Davis's idea. He bought the patent in 1873, and history was made. Without Strauss, jeans may never have got off the ground. It's quite fortuitous that these two people came together and realized uh, a sort of hole in the market that enabled jeans to become a thing. Right? It's not so, so often you'd think that you know, a tailor um, would get into business with the person who was essentially giving them the material to, to come up with a whole new thing. So it was actually quite lucky that, that they had this idea and they made it work. The new invention was originally known as waist overalls. Back in the day, the garments came with the reassuring guarantee that the copper rivets wouldn't scratch or damage furniture when you sat down and the promise of a new pair for free if the jeans were to rip. Such was the confidence in the new invention. In the early years, they didn't have belt loops, as seen in this vintage pair bought in 1917. There's only one back pocket and three front pockets, the smallest designed for a pocket watch. This pair were worn every day for three years, except on Sundays, by a miner called Homer Campbell. He patched and padded them for extra protection but underneath all those patches, the original jeans were still intact. With stories like this, no wonder jeans were such a successful invention. We seem to have a never-ending appetite for jeans, though the basic concept has never changed. It's not very often that you have an idea that will last an entire century and beyond. So they, they did something which was so right. Nobody's found a way to improve it in all that time. This small factory makes 200 pairs of jeans a week. Every single pair is handmade by one of these highly skilled artisans, known here as Grand Masters. The emergence of niche brands and premium jeans is a modern phenomenon. But such is the size and breadth of the market, the spectrum between mass-produced and artisan luxury garments seems to get wider. 
there's a lot of geekiness to jeans, just like there's geekiness to coffee. You know, there's, you know, plantation denim, there's salvage denim, there's, you know, there's the warp and the weft, there's all sorts of nuance. And, and there's some great denim mills and there's not some great denim mills. And people want to, you know, work with the best Japanese denim or the finest Italian denim. So it gets very geeky. However much designers tweak and modify the various component parts of their products, the customer is relying on their new pair of jeans to fit and to be right for them. There's great freedom of movement. I don't have to worry about carrying myself in a pair of jeans. The jeans do that for me. I definitely feel comfortable. Like, I feel, I feel like I'm myself and yet stylish. If there's figure-hugging ones, I can feel quite sexy. Um, or if they're just like my super relaxed ones, then I just feel at home. In the late 19th century, there was no suggestion that the new denim blue workwear was in any way stylish. Yet Jacob Davis took the trouble to choose a contrasting rust color for the visible stitching on the garments, which complemented the copper-colored rivets. It distinguished them from rivals' copies and became something that is still important in generic jeans tailoring. Despite this nod to aesthetics, workwear design was fundamentally functional. Thanks to the strong cotton denim fabric, the target buyers did tough manual jobs, not only gold prospecting and mining, but they were ranch hands, railroad workers, and farmers. These working men weren't interested in fashion. They just wanted their clothing to last, and denim hit the mark. It's incredibly durable. It's absorbent, uh, and so it wicks away moisture from our bodies and keeps us cool, um, but is also breathable. And because it's just made out of cellulose plant fibers, it, it's, it's relatively cheap and easy to produce. But there was a problem with one key aspect of denim manufacturing. It was the color blue, thanks to indigo, which has been used as a cloth dye for at least the last 4,000 years. And color is important to us. The question of how you color clothing, of how you introduce dyes into your fabrics, is, is one that goes back millennia. And one of the oldest ways of dyeing cloth blue was to use indigo. There are two ways of getting indigo. I mean, one is one is woad, um, which the ancient Britons daubed themselves in. The other thing is to use uh, the indigo plant, which is, is native to, to, to the Orient, and particularly uh, in India. The invention of jeans and their immediate popularity led to a massive increase in demand for indigo, which created the original and iconic blue denim color. Curiously, the color we now know as indigo was given its name by Sir Isaac Newton in the 17th century. He had identified the seven colors in the visible spectrum. But for the purposes of identification, they all needed a name. Newton named the two new ones orange and indigo. To me, indigo is the color which Isaac Newton made the name up for. It didn't used to exist until Isaac Newton started talking about rainbows. And he wanted it to match like musical scales. So he just added an extra one in and created indigo as a, as a word. Newton's inclusion of indigo is now being questioned. However, using a dark blue fabric for his new workwear was a clever move by Jacob Davis. It's a color that clearly resonates with people. I think color does have an effect on, on us, and I think that's um, I think it's a very subjective thing about colour as well, and there's certain colours that I think are universally understood. Uh, red, for, for one, um, we know that it might mean danger, it might be, mean warmth, so we, we have a language for that. And I think the same goes for blue, with um, coolness. And I think the, the word coolness associated with jeans has become just that. It's hip, it's now, it's the thing to do, and I think that's where we kind of zero in on the, on, the, on the dark blue denim. We get it. One of the earliest indigo producers was India, used in its culture like this, for example, and a custom dating back over 4,000 years. 
This family in Tamil Nadu, South India, still produce indigo dye using traditional methods. They cultivate the Indigofera tinctoria plant, which they harvest and then steep in large vats of water mixed with an alkaline such as soda ash or potash. Surprisingly, the water turns green at first, but the natural blue will emerge in the process. So indigo is a, a fascinating dye because it's one of the rare dyes that we can get from nature that's blue. The liquid is physically stimulated by these workers, who add oxygen in the process to ferment the leaves, which releases indigo pigment as a sediment. They skim off and remove the scum, and then transfer the sediment to copper vats. It's boiled vigorously for a couple of hours and then filtered through pieces of cloth. The resulting derivative in the form of a paste is the indigo dye, which is cut into cubes and dried, but it doesn't dissolve and must undergo a chemical reaction to dilute it. Because indigo is not water soluble, it requires uh, chemical processes to turn it into something that's useful uh, to be added to a dye. Um, and this produces waste products like sulfates and sulfites. And these are bad for life. If you get them into the rivers and, and, and so on, they kill off fish. Uh, they're also corrosive to pipes. And so this is sort of the eternal battle for dye producers, is to find a way of making our, our clothes the color we want them to be um, without damaging the environment. There had to be a synthetic solution. It was German chemist Adolf von Bayer who found it. In 1905, he was awarded a Nobel Prize for his groundbreaking work in deciphering the chemical structure of indigo. Von Bayer's work led him to invent a synthetic replacement for the precursor itself. And it's the production of these chemical dyes pioneered in Germany, which uh, enables the industrial scale of, of coloring, which produces now most of the genes, most of the blue genes that we wear. Despite the change in dye from natural to synthetic, nobody noticed a difference in the color of their blue denim jeans. The target buyers of those early jeans did not disappoint. They bought this revolutionary new clothing and expansion in manufacturing was on its way. The next step was to spread the word, widen the market, appeal to the masses. And that happened in several ways. I think what's interesting about jeans is they were a workman's trouser, but then they became something much more than that. They became, they were so good, they were so long lasting or whatever, that everybody started wearing them although they did become a bit of a social signal as well. But the market didn't widen until Hollywood moved the goalposts. In the 1920s and 30s, movie directors started dressing their cowboy heroes in denim jeans. This gave jeans street cred and helped them to reach a much wider audience. I think there's a particularly American story there, and that's about the American love of the frontier. It's about the American dream of manifest destiny and the idea that all Americans, at least all white Americans, are, you know, somehow pioneers. By the 1950s, one of the most famous cowboys of them all, John Wayne, was thrilling audiences clad in a more flattering cut of the original working man's blue jeans. Wayne personified the macho Wild West dressed in denim. Now jeans appeal to the young who wanted to show some individuality. But wearing jeans also became associated with a certain defiance against authority. Hollywood heartthrob James Dean exemplified teenage delinquency in the movie Rebel Without a Cause. He played the ultimate brooding rebel against authority. And of course, he was wearing blue denim jeans. In the 50s, what you see is jeans being worn by film stars like James Dean and, and by 
singers like Elvis, and this is a, a sign of their of their rebellious streak. It's a sign of them as ordinary men with extraordinary talents, and it's a sign of youth. Everyone wants some of that. And so jeans become a symbol of youth, and then they become a symbol of everyone, of every man, and every woman too. At the same time, the raucous sounds of rock and roll were breaking through. As Elvis Presley wiggled his hips in blue jeans, amplifying the sex appeal of jeans. If you think about Elvis Presley, at a time they were coming out of almost a repressed society into somebody wearing jeans, uh, doing his moves. All of this is about rebellion. It's a, about the birth of something new. He's becoming a big star. Of course, everybody wants to emulate that. It's really sexy. What a seductive combination. Despite their growing popularity in Hollywood and with America's youth, blue jeans were banned in certain places like restaurants, theaters, and schools. Even crooner and actor Bing Crosby was apparently refused entry to a smart hotel in Canada when he was dressed from top to toe, inappropriately, in denim. Some countries, like Russia, refused to import them. The authorities believed they represented freedom and democracy. As a result, ordinary Russians were desperate to get a hold of a pair. European countries embraced them. American soldiers stationed in post-war Germany were seen off-duty wearing jeans. Enterprising clothing manufacturer Albert Seffernack traded six bottles of booze with some American GIs for six pairs of jeans, which he set out to copy in his workshop. He imported denim from the States, and a European brand of jeans was born. Celebrity endorsement fuels the jeans market as much today as it did in the past. As companies develop their own interpretations of this legendary piece of clothing, nothing helps them more than a big star wearing their jeans, because their fans will want to copy them. Wanting to emulate somebody you idolize is pretty much part of the human condition. We always aspire to how did they get there? How do they do that? I want some of that reflected glory. I want to feel what they feel. I want to stand in their aura. And I think when it's something that is seemingly accessible, like if I wear those jeans, I will feel more like them or I'll feel more positive. That is why we do that. And royalty somehow brings a magic all of its own. Orders skyrocketed once a pair of black skinny jeans from the Little Welsh factory had been modeled by one of the most famous women in the world. Suddenly Meghan Markle wears your jeans and you go, thank you universe, that's super lucky. And, but it does change your company because suddenly um, a lot more people in the world know that you exist. We didn't plan it, there wasn't a strategy. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it was a, you know, it was just a, a piece of luck. For decades, we've taken female endorsement of jeans for granted, but it wasn't always so. Jeans played a crucial role in the battle for equality of the sexes. It began by women daring to wear their brother's or husband's jeans when they had menial physical jobs to do, like washing the car or helping out on the ranch. There's a real anxiety amongst some people about women wearing trousers, um, pretending to be men. That caused tremendous anxiety in the 19th century and into the 20th century. Women wearing jeans is, is making an even stronger point in some respect. And so again, it's about rebellion. It's about, it's about you know, women um, showing that they're not going to be held back by conventional bourgeois norms. It wasn't as though women elsewhere in the world weren't already wearing leg-covering garments. Pantaloons had been common across Europe and Asia for centuries. And even during the mid-1800s, 
Western women had started wearing a garment called bloomers, which were particularly practical for cycling and horse riding. I mean, jeans is such a great invention because, you know, as someone who's ridden horses all their life, I know how important it is to have thick, thick trousers to protect your legs from the, from the straps and so on. Um, and jeans provide this layer of protection. But for the women of America, wearing blue jeans as a practical solution for hard graft outdoors soon morphed into a fashion statement all of its own. Women were an untapped market, and designers and advertisers jumped to attention. Finally, manufacturers recognized a potential new clientele to exploit. In 1934, a working garment called Lady Levi's was launched. They were aimed at women on farms and ranches, but women were definitely not to be seen out in society in blue jeans, and wearing them didn't mean they were equal to men. I think something like having your own pair of jeans was a signal that, you know, we want equal rights. It's right at the forefront of that movement, you know, clothes are politics, aren't they? They, they send out a particular message, and I think women driving for that is, is, is a, behind that is also driving for their own freedom to express themselves the way they want to. Women weren't the only sector of society to change the future of jeans. In the early days, when the burgeoning jeans industry was aimed at laborers, bibbed denim workwear, or dungarees, were worn by America's former slaves. Slavery had theoretically been abolished there only a few years before the invention of jeans. Many had become tenant farmers, known as sharecroppers, a practice that lasted way into the 20th century. Ironically, one of their principal crops was cotton, that fundamental element in the production of denim jeans. In the 1960s, when the American Civil Rights Movement took hold, male and female marchers wore dungarees to demonstrate how little had changed for African Americans since slavery had been abolished. And in the 60s, it is used by some people uh, in the Civil Rights Movement to, in these dungarees, to, to recall the plantation, to recall slavery, and to recall the fact that these were the clothes that were forced upon them. You know, denim was worn by the enslaved, made to wear by their slave owners, because they were the ones working in the fields, picking the cotton, doing all the grunt, dirty work. And they were wearing them now to protest, to say, you know, we were separate then and we're separate now. And they were making a very powerful political point. It was another step in rendering jeans the garment of choice for everyone a potent symbol of equality, of the sexes, of race, of wealth. The 60s also brought flower power and bell bottoms to jeans. People went to town with their own designs, creating customized individual looks that reflected the chilled, psychedelic vibe of the time. Others played with bleaching when it became fashionable to wear much lighter blue denim, and the versatility of jeans has never faded. Oh, I've done everything you can think of to jeans. I've ripped them, I've cut them off, I've added flares to them. When I was 12, I don't know why I did that. I've shredded them, I've turned them into a top. Jeans, the clothing of the people, became a vehicle for self-expression, individualism, and creativity, and not just for humans to model. I think I even, oh yeah, I think I did, I made them so that they would fit on the dog. I used to like dressing up my mom's dogs. In the 1970s, punks would tear their jeans at the knees add safety pins and chains, along with patches of worn and frayed denim in random places, making jeans look considerably older, tattier, and altogether rougher, and bringing a bit of anarchy to the party. It's a rebellion against 
bourgeois conventionality. It's a rebellion against neatly pressed uh, trousers, if you like. It might have shocked Strauss and Davis that their innocuous invention would become symbolic of a subversive underground culture, with young people challenging authority and wanting to exert their independence. And their invention, specifically designed not to rip, was defiantly ripped. I think what makes people want to rebel is about saying, I'm an individual, this is my identity, and I'm going to put my stamp on it. And when we tend to see the biggest surge in rebellion is when we are teenagers, when we are separating from parents, and we are wanting to hang out with our peers, and everything to do with following the rules and being good becomes, we want to throw that out and I want to do me. And to tear something up is to say, you know, I, I'm, I am being rebellious. This is about what I want. And, you know, two fingers up to society, parents, work, whatever it is. In the 1980s, the marketing people were at it again on a mission to boost sales. This TV commercial stood out for its brazen sexiness, casting a good-looking model stripping down to his underwear in a laundrette. The 1950s production design, perhaps a nod back to the heyday of all American jeans. The commercial was so successful, it seems it was taken off air because the makers couldn't keep up with demand. Despite the message in the commercial, there's a question about how often to wash your jeans. I personally would have tried on many pairs to get the correct fitting jeans. And if I wear them too much, they kind of go out of shape. And so washing them for me is kind of like hitting the reset button. There's also a persistent trend to shrink to fit. The theory is that if you wash your jeans and put them on while they're wet, they will shrink to fit your body more snugly. And jeans have seen another idea, that you can rid your dirty jeans of unpleasant odors by freezing them for a few days to literally kill the smell. The smells that come from your dirty jeans are from bacteria breaking down all the goodness that you've gotten into the jeans. Um, and freezing them, yes, it temporarily sort of freezes the bacteria from doing what they, they were doing. But as soon as they warm up again, the smell will come back. Uh, I mean, if you want to get rid of the bacteria for good, then you need to either heat up the jeans. You could cook your jeans, maybe, but then they'll probably become a bit charred and, and not so optimal either. Jeans have survived periods of huge change. Revolutions, world wars, the creation of other great inventions, and fashions. They, they just seem to have this sort of cultural points that they've sort of become hugely relevant again. And they, obviously, they've never really gone away. But there are these sort of like landmark moments where some sort of genes have captivated the look of a decade. Where does the jeans industry go from here? There are big questions over sustainability and the impact jeans manufacturing is having on the planet. I think, you know, the way jeans are made has costs to nature, to the natural world, to the environment. And I think moving forward, you know, it would be important for companies to think about sustainable um, materials and um, how things can be recycled, made, produced, because this is, this is a fashion that's not going away anytime soon. So if we can think about sustainability, that's going to matter much more moving forward. Modern manufacturers must tackle the issues to maintain the generally wholesome image of jeans as a garment for the people. You know, making a pair of jeans can be an ugly process. You know, there's a lot of dyes, there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of water. Jeans manufacturing not only uses harmful chemicals, but there is a huge amount of water and washing in the production process. Women tend to prefer a bit more elasticity in the jean. Um, the wash is just to help get the stiffness out of the denim. Most manufacturers wash denim several times for a number of reasons. 
not just softening them up to make them more acceptable to the consumer. In this Indian factory, piles of jeans are loaded into industrial-scale washing machines. Soap powder is added to remove residual dye and dust. Thousands of liters of water are used in this single process in one factory. Plus, denim is known for shrinking, so it's washed to prevent customers buying a garment that doesn't fit once they've washed it themselves. The best thing you can do for the environment is not wash jeans. You know, 80% of the impact you know, comes from you and I washing and ironing our jeans. But like, let's be honest, like, we're a maker, we're part of the problem, but it's our intention to make jeans with the lowest amount of energy, the lowest amount of water, the lowest amount of chemicals. The blue jean can be very green, and I think that's the future. This company in Switzerland is making compostable jeans. Inspired to create functional and biodegradable clothes for their factory workers. They use a cotton alternative, flax, which requires much less water to grow. The linen from flax is combined with hemp, another plant-based fiber, to make a robust, tear-proof denim. The fabric is dyed using sustainable methods, and the garments are entirely manufactured in Europe. They don't use rivets, and the only thing that doesn't biodegrade is the metal buttons, but they can be kept and reused. Composting takes just a few months. Jeans can also be successfully recycled. I like making recycled things. That's actually a great thing about jeans, is that they recycle into all kinds of different clothing very easily. But for denim that is not going to be repurposed into another piece of clothing, this recycling program in the United States shreds millions of unwanted denim garments and compacts them into bales for use in home insulation. Then it's down to forward-thinking builders to use it in construction. The global success and enduring appeal of jeans has been immeasurable. Jeans are the great leveler, the clothing of the people, the clothing of our time, and the clothing of choice for many for the last 150 years. Jeans are a great invention because they're the great democratic clothing. Everyone can wear them. Everyone does wear them. Intended to clothe gold diggers in durable workwear that wouldn't rip at the pockets or anywhere else, they've turned into a fashion statement like no other. A globally popular, ordinary piece of clothing that it's impossible to imagine the world's wardrobes without. I think jeans are an amazing invention because they look great, they're sturdy, they can last a very long time, and they're, all, they're almost peerless when it comes to fashion. Image makers might have it as an all-American story, but in fact, jeans are the product of European innovation that provided the raw material for a once obscure American tailor to craft a winner and his supplier who had the means to make it happen.